Did you know that cows are basically superheroes? Cow. <laughs> yep, they are responsible for saving millions of lives. Cow. Well, it all comes down to the incredible invention of the vaccine. In this video, we're going to be talking about how vaccines are made. I'll start by telling you the origin story of vaccines, which I'll begin with cows. And since many vaccines, including the COVID-19 vaccines, are designed to protect our bodies against viruses, we're going to take a quick moment to talk through the different components of a virus. And finally, we'll go through how different types of vaccines are made. All right, let's do this. Let's start with a story about how cows created the first vaccine. A few hundred years ago, people all around the globe were getting sick from a disease called smallpox. What is smallpox? Smallpox was a painful and deadly virus that was really contagious, meaning it could easily infect other people and spread. As more and more communities became infected, some farmers, doctors, and researchers noticed something interesting. There were a specific set of people who were not getting sick from smallpox. Cattle farmers and milkmaids. Why? Great question. For some reason, people who worked closely with cows were protected from getting smallpox. Instead, they were contracting a safer and milder cattle disease called cowpox. Is cowpox a better virus but for cows? Yep, but if a person got it, it would often show up as a blister or rash on their hands. Ew. Which, you know, is not exactly an enjoyable experience, but far better than contracting a deadly illness. Meanwhile, a farmer named Ben Jesty made this connection between smallpox and cowpox. Farmers? I love farmers! He and his family carried out a pretty brilliant experiment. They took a little bit of pus, Yuck. I know, from a cowpox blister on their cow's udder and scratched it into their own skin so they would get cowpox. And guess what? No one in their family became sick from the far more deadly smallpox disease. Whoa, cool! Around the same time, there was a country doctor named Ed. Ed. Who made the same connection between smallpox and cowpox as Ben and his family. So, Dr. Ed conducted a similar experiment. However, I should point out it did not meet today's standards for ethics and research. First, he inoculated a patient with cowpox. Then, and this is the sketchy part, he exposed the patient to smallpox to determine if the cowpox inoculation had protected them. This was a risky thing to do. Fortunately for everybody, it worked. It was protected. With this discovery, he began the active process of community inoculation, saving countless lives, drastically decreasing the spread of smallpox, and without fully realizing it, had laid the foundation for vaccine development and our current understanding of the adaptive immune system and acquired immunity. Now that we all have a deep and abiding appreciation for cows, let's talk about how vaccines are made. Vaccines can be created for all kinds of different pathogens, but since we're focusing on viruses, let's first discuss the components of a virus to better understand why we make vaccines the way we do. Here's a little sticky note version of the virus that causes COVID-19. Let's take a quick look inside. Since viruses are three-dimensional, I also included a line here so you can better visualize what it actually looks like to take a cross-section. Now we can see a clear layout of the two viral components. Do you remember the two main things that make up a virus? I'm a good forgetter and a good remember. Me too. How about I share what I remember, and then if something comes to mind, you share that too. One thing all viruses have are their genetic instructions. They're basically an instruction manual for how to build the virus. Don't have their instructions, they can't remember how to make more viruses. Exactly! Awesome remembering! The other component is the viral protein capsid which functions as a container to hold the virus's genetic instructions and contains the spike proteins that help the virus get into our cells. Like this? Uh-huh, like that. All right, we made it to the final part. Now we can talk about how we make vaccines. There are several types of vaccines that can be used to help our bodies fight off an infection. First up is the inactivated vaccine. This type of vaccine is made by killing the pathogen that we want to protect ourselves from. That way, it can't replicate and infect us when we receive the vaccine. Yay! The microbiologist in me has to point out that viruses don't technically meet the criteria to be considered alive, so we describe them as being inactivated instead of killed. But the concept is still there. 
because inactivated vaccines use quote unquote a dead virus, our immune system doesn't respond to the same degree as it would a live pathogen. For this reason, these vaccines require follow up doses in order to more fully develop and maintain our immune response. Some examples include vaccines for the flu and polio, as well as those for shingles and the DTaP vaccine, which protects against diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Next up are live attenuated vaccines. Unlike inactivated vaccines, live attenuated vaccines use a live or active form of the pathogen. However, they change or attenuate it, removing or inactivating the harmful portions. So like here, look, I'm taking all those things off. Blech. We don't want that stuff. Get rid of that stuff. Once it's been altered sufficiently, it can be used in a vaccine to trigger an immune response without being harmful to our bodies. Good job. Some examples of live attenuated vaccines include the smallpox vaccine, which fully eradicated smallpox by the 1980s, and the MMR vaccine, which protects against mumps, measles, and rubella. Ready for the next one? This next type of vaccine I'll refer to as a subunit vaccine. There are a lot of versions of these vaccines. However, their overarching approach is the same. Instead of inactivating or attenuating a fully intact pathogen, Subunit vaccines only use the key parts of the pathogen which will trigger our immune response. So, for example, they could break apart a virus and just put certain pieces within the vaccine. How do they break the virus? Wow, that's a really good question. I don't know the full answer. My guess would be that they probably use heat or some sort of mechanical agent that breaks it up, or maybe some chemicals. Awesome question. We should check that out. Some examples of subunit vaccines include vaccines for hepatitis B and the human papillomavirus. They can also include vaccines designed to target bacterial toxins, like those that cause tetanus and botulism. Now we're going to go over these two vaccines that we have for the coronavirus for COVID-19. Because those are the that we got to get for this virus. Yep. These are the primary vaccines being used to protect against COVID-19. This first type is called an mRNA vaccine, and it's pretty awesome. The research which shaped the development of mRNA vaccines was led by Dr. Catalin Carrico, who has been studying mRNA since the 1990s. So let's walk through how this vaccine is made. The focus of mRNA vaccines are the virus's genetic instructions. These genetic instructions are used by the virus in order to make more of itself. However, researchers making these vaccines are only interested in the part of the genetic instructions that tell how to make the spike protein. See, the spike protein is important because it's the part of the virus that is able to get it inside of our cells and is the most easily recognized by our immune system. So by splicing the virus's mRNA and removing all of the genetic instructions except for the spike protein, researchers were able to make a vaccine that could allow our cells to make the spike protein on its own without any other portion of the virus, which would then teach our adaptive immune system how to recognize the virus without ever having to be exposed to it. One key obstacle that researchers had to overcome was the fact that mRNA is negatively charged, as is the outer part of our cell membranes, which means when the two come in close contact together, they would repel one another, kind of like magnets. So researchers wrapped the mRNA in a lipid coating, which neutralized the interaction between these electrical charges, allowing the mRNA to slip inside our cells and begin producing the spike protein. It's a little cute. Pretty ingenious. Both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine use this mRNA technology. The other type of vaccine being used for COVID-19 is a viral vector vaccine. This type of vaccine also focuses on the genetic instructions for the spike protein. We do it again? Yeah, like the mRNA vaccines, we just want the instructions that make that spike protein. Uh, <laughs> because I cut it for the earlier video and I didn't want to draw another one, so I just taped it back together. So here we isolate the virus's genetic material, which for COVID-19 is single-stranded mRNA. However, for the viral vector vaccine, we transcribe the mRNA into double-stranded DNA. And then we splice off the spike protein portion. Here's where we get to the viral vector part. In biology, vectors act like a vessel or a container, so a viral vector is essentially a virus behaving like a container. In the case of the COVID-19 vaccine, researchers use a harmless adenovirus container in order to carry the spike protein into our cells. That is a good one? Yeah, the adenovirus vector is safe or benign for our body, which means we don't have to use the coronavirus protein capsid in order to get the spike protein DNA into our cells. Whoa. Cool. cool. For COVID-19, both the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca vaccines use viral vectors. Hopefully now you can feel a lot more informed when you go into the doctor to get a vaccine. 
you haven't had a chance yet, there are two other videos, one that talks about how the coronavirus spreads and another that discusses how our bodies respond if we get infected by a coronavirus. And stay tuned because there's another video coming out soon, hopefully really soon. I'm discovering it takes a long time to make these videos. This next video is gonna combine what we learned about our immune system and what we've learned about the COVID-19 vaccines and how they work together to keep us safe. Until next time, be sure to thank a cow for being a superhero. Super cow!